word. 1 Timothy chapter number 3, I want to read verses 14 through 16. <clears throat> but these things write unto thee, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Paul is writing to his young son in the ministry by the name of Timothy. Here in these verses, I believe in one phrase. Paul lays out the major theme of this whole book. It's found in verse 15 when he said that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. If you notice that phrase, that word know there means a practical working knowledge. It is not just an understanding of the intellectual facts, but it's something that we have practiced in our life. We know it from experience, if you will. Then he says in the phrase, not only know, it is practical knowledge, but he says how thou oughtest to behave. That word behave goes deeper than just our conduct. It speaks of a a pattern of life. When I was a young boy growing up, my maternal grandmother was my live-in, if you will, babysitter. Now, she preferred my sister over me. So every Easter and Christmas and every special occasion, my grandmother would load us up and go down to a local store called Hamrick's. And she'd go over and pick out a big old piece of cloth. And she'd get the cloth that she wanted. And she'd walk over to these funny-looking papers that had these little designs on them. And she'd pick out one of those and I come to find out that those little papers was called a pattern and she told me that she could take that cloth and lay it out and she could lay that pattern on that cloth and follow that pattern and she said if I follow that pattern just like it is she'd show me the picture on front of the pattern she said your sister I'll have a dress that looks just like this and every time she followed that pattern my sister wore a dress to a special occasion or church that looked just what Paul is saying to Timothy here is our life our behavior should be following a pattern the problem is we're following the wrong pattern we're caught up in what the world thinks the pattern ought to be we're trying to impress the world we're trying to fit in to the world as God's people or we're following a man or we're following a philosophy and we're patterning our life but Paul wrote to Timothy and said thou ought to know how to behave how to pattern your life and that pattern of course is the Lord Jesus matter of fact God predestinated don't choke on that word it's a good Bible word God predestinated before the world ever began that everybody that received Christ would be conformed into the image of his son I believe God meant for us now to start following the pattern. Timothy follow the pattern. You ought to know the pattern. You ought to follow the pattern. It is for the pattern for our life. Then he uses this word I think changes everything about what we think. He says how to behave how to pattern your life in, in, he doesn't say at he says in the house of God. I believe he's speaking of our position. He gets real personal here. He's not just talking about somewhere that we attend. Now let me just stop and talk to you from when I was a pastor. When I was a pastor we anointed this part called the sanctuary. We prayed over it. We set it aside. We didn't have parties in here. We didn't have games in here. We didn't eat and fellowship in here. It was set apart for him. We didn't come make it about us. We didn't entertain in here. It was set apart and was for him. When you come into this part, I believe now I'm giving you my opinion when you come into this part of the house of God you ought to check yourself at the door there and leave all of that out there and come in only for him everything you do
doing here ought to be for him in or at the house of God. But Paul's talking more than just a place that we attend when he said in the house of God. Thank God I'm not only at the house of God, but I'm in the house of God, baptized into his body. Hallelujah. And what Tim what Paul is telling Timothy is it is time to be the church, not just be at the church. We're caught up in a day where people think they've done God a favor because they're at the church for an hour on Sunday. But he's not talking about, do you say, should we be at the church every time the doors open? I'm all for the local body of Christ. I'm a member of a church. I'm a supporting member of that church. I believe every time you have an opportunity, every time you're physically able, you ought to be at the church. But it goes more deeper than that. You want me, you want me to tell you why in this day in which we live, we don't know how to behave at the house of God because we don't know how to behave in the house of God in the body of Christ we're belonging to a church we're being at a church but Timothy he says I want you to be the church and for a few minutes tonight I want to preach on that thought be the church that word be is a present tense action word you've got to do something there has to be a meaning to it there has to be a reason for it and he lays it out here on be the church see I think you and I who are birthed into his body who are part of his family must we have to be the church because of the master of the church look at what he says you ought to you ought to he said that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Now I believe he could be talking about a building, uh, but I think it goes deeper than that, and he's talking about a body. We ought to behave a certain way in the house. Let me just go ahead uh, and make some of you mad. I think we ought to dress a certain way. We ought to act a certain way. We ought to talk a certain way. I don't care what Kentucky did uh, at the football game uh, when I come to the house of God. I like to fish, but I ain't come to the house of God to hear about your fishing trip. I came here tonight uh, to hear about him, uh, to speak about him, uh, to sing about him, uh, and to worship him. Not only because I'm at the church, but hallelujah, I'm in the church. Not only because it's a building, but it's a body, and you and I must be the church. It's a building but it's a body. Watch what it says about this body, this building, this body. He said, which is the church of, <clears throat> that word of gives us the, uh, the truth about the possessor of the church, which is the church of, hallelujah, I'm glad the master possesses the church. You know why he possesses it? Because he purchased it. He bought it with his own blood. Uh, I belong to him. I have no recourse to be what God saved me and called me to be because he is my master. I am his servant. Folk don't like you to use this terminology today, but I don't have any problem with saying he is my master and I am his slave because it's not bad to be a slave when and you got the right master. If you got a master that loves you and takes care of you and looks out for you and protects you, hallelujah, I'm glad uh, to have my master. I don't have any problem telling you Jesus is my master. I don't have any problem submitting to him. I don't have any problem letting you know, know he owns me. He runs my life. He has full authority over me. I love you. I want to get along with you. But if we have to part company. Either I got to part with him or I got to part with you. I'm sorry, but he's my master. If you don't like the way I do it, take it up with him. If you don't like the way I live it, take it up with him. If you don't like where I go, how I deliver it, how I live, take it up with him because he is my master. He's the possessor. He owns the church. Now we get an idea that we own the church, but that ain't what Paul told Timothy. You don't own the church. He owns the church. Not only is he the possessor of the church, he is the power of the church. Watch your Bible again. He said the church of the possessor of the living God. 
I'm glad I'm not serving some kind of philosophy some kind of dogmatic doctrine that we came up with but I'm serving a living holy God I'm not worshiping a statue I'm not worshiping a bunch of bones wrapped up like a mummy I'm not worshiping some graveside I'm glad hallelujah I'm worshiping a God who's alive and well and he's doing all right you ask me how I know he lives he lives within my heart you call him dead if you want to the world can write him off if you want to but there's somebody tonight a stirring up down on the inside of me I'm alive because the living God is living on the inside of me I'm being the church because my power comes from a living God power I'm going to just go ahead and say this we get around the altar we get in the prayer closet and we spend all our time praying for power you ain't got to pray for power you got God living down on the inside of you. You got more power than you know what to do with. You just need to appropriate the power of God that's in you. Now I'm going to back it up with a verse. Now unto him that's able to do exceeding going way past abundantly going way past abundantly above all that you can ask or think. A lot of guys stop right there. But Paul said according to the power that worketh in us in the church the church is not to be impotent the church is not to be powerless the church is not to be floundering around like a fish out of water we are the powerful uh, people of God because we have God living down on the inside of us he is the possessor of the church he is the power of the church don't think it's in you don't think it's in me I can't bring revival or salvation or joy or peace in a sermon and a brief case or in a thought but hallelujah I know one who can take the feeble effort of his servant drive it home to a heart and change your life with the power that he gave to the church Amen. told those early disciples you wait at Jerusalem until you be endued with power but it doesn't stop there from on high he is the power of the church well I just think the church is going to go under got good news for you the church ain't a going under honey she's a going up glory to God we're not on the losing side we're on the winning side when you look like a loser you're still a winner when you look like a winner you're a winner when you feel like a loser guess what you're still a winner because it is the church of the living God that's why things at the church ought not be dead. That's why you ought not be dead in your life. That's why people, you come to church if you want to. Sit there like a knot on the log, look at me and frown uh, till your uh, uh, lip fall all the way down on your uh, shoulders. I don't, it ain't going to bother me. I made my mind up a long time ago that whether you like it or not, whether you worship or not, whether you enjoy it or not, I'm going to get everything I can get out of it. And every time I'm given an opportunity to say something, to stand behind a pulpit, I'm letting it all hang out, if you will. I'm giving it everything I've got, and I'm enjoying it. When you don't enjoy the preaching don't worry about brother Weaver I'm enjoying it hallelujah cause it's the church of the living God I have no power but his power and I have his power I have all power the master of the church not only do I see the master of the church I say we ought to be the church because of the must of the church. So look at this next phrase in verse 15. He said, The church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. <laughs> now, let me make a statement here. If there ought to be one place where people know, they ought to know, they ought to know that if you turn in off Pleasant Valley Way into the parking lot, of Emmanuel Baptist Church and park and walk through them doors you ain't necessarily going to get what you thought you was going to get you ain't going to necessarily like everything you hear and it ain't going to line up with your little philosophy but they ought to know we can go down there to Emmanuel Baptist Church and whether we like it or not whether we want it or not we're going to hear the truth if there anywhere that people ought to be able to get the truth it ought to be at the house of God it ought to be at the church 
serve of the living God but I'm going to go a step further if they ought to be able to get the truth they ought to be able to get it from you uh, as uh, a part of the body part of the bride uh, part of the building if they ask your opinion you ought to warn them I'm a Christian and I believe the Bible and you may not want to know mine because it might not line up I lost a lot of friends even some preacher friends because I tried to keep my big mouth shut and stay out of it and they messed up and said well, what do you think about it I said well they said oh see I was going to let it slide and they said oh come on what do you think about it then got mad at me when I told them <laughs> you ought not ask me if you don't want the truth I mean, I admit that I've kind of got a brace of personality. Sometimes I might not say it as delicately as it could be said. You pray for me. I might not say it as soft as it could be said or as understanding and loving sometimes. But I promise you that as far as God will help me, if you ask me, I'm basing it on the truth and I'm going to just look you eyeball to eyeball and tell you the truth. Because to be the church, they must know that they're going to get the truth from the church they live in a world uh, that every time you turn on the TV or the radio every time you listen to a commercial a broadcast a news report every time you send those kids to a public school every time some politician speaks you get uh, double talk and sideway mouth language and you get half truths and full up fledged lies uh, but it ought not be at the church we are the pillar and the ground of the truth they ought to know when they ask a born again blood wash saved by grace through faith old time Bible believing Christian that we're going to give them the truth we're not going to what well, let's hold on because you got to give them the truth when it's my boy and you got to stand for the truth when it's your boy when it's your grandson or granddaughter it's just as wrong as when it's mine it's just as wrong as when it's them who are out in the world we are to stand with the truth let me get to my point he said the pillar I'm saying that so I don't say it real country and say pillar the pillar the pillar not pillow like we looked at the other night his sleep on but pillar a support beam we are the support of the truth y'all to support it Y'all to want it. I'm going to just go ahead and tell you. Not anybody can be my pastor. I just wouldn't be a member anywhere else. I wouldn't be two Sundays in a church that wouldn't preach the truth. If they wouldn't preach that hell was hot and heaven was sweet. If they wouldn't preach the blood of Jesus still cleanseth from all sin. If they wouldn't preach the true, pure, unadulterated gospel of Jesus Christ. I, I wouldn't probably last through the first service. Hallelujah. I'd find me one. My mama called me when she got a, before she passed, she got kind of, she couldn't go and she couldn't go far and she said there's no church around here that's worth going to she said what would you do if you there was no churches around that's worth going to I'd say drive as far as I had to drive <laughs> I'd just uh, uh, buy a motel room stay overnight if I had to because that's how important the church is in my life and that's how important it is for us who are in the church to be the church I need the truth I want the truth just look me eyeball to eyeball and give me the truth yeah it hurts but I'm going to support the truth that's why I try to preach the Bible just like God wrote it I don't try to make anything up I don't try to figure out all them deep dark maybes and could be's and all of that I'm just trying to tell you the truth I'm just telling you what this book said if you don't like the way I'm doing it fine but if you're mad about what the book said take it up with him I, I didn't write the truth I'm not the truth but I'm a pillar of the truth I'm just supporting the truth I'm for the truth I like the truth I love the truth I'm just just go support the truth. Be the church. Support the truth. <laughs> then he said not only the pillar of the truth, but the ground of the truth. I think he's talking about safeguarding the truth. The ground. It's it. If you let me say it like this. It's ground zero around here. You come in here, we ain't watering it down. We're not compromising it. We're not going to mix it all with love till it all tastes good. It's ground zero right here. 
You don't get nothing here but the truth. Yeah, it hurts. Yeah, it rubs you wrong. But I'm going to tell you this. I don't care how loud he preaches. I don't care how long he preaches. He skinned back that old black back King James Bible and preached the truth. He may run me to the altar, but he won't run me to the house. I don't like a liar. I don't like being lied to. I don't like being stabbed in the back, manipulated, conned. I like that man of God look right at you for eyeball to eyeball and just tell you the truth. Just tell you the truth. Jesus said, I am the truth. And we as the church ought to be the ground. We ought to safeguard the truth. We ought to stand with the truth. We ought to stay with the truth. I don't know about you, but I'm going to support and stay with the truth. That's why I don't need a new denomination. I don't need to recover from anything. I don't need a new dress code. I don't need to be able to do things that used to be a sin and live a good, happy uh, fleshly life. I don't need a new Bible. I don't need a new Savior. I like the one I got. Hallelujah. I don't need nothing new. I'm just going to stay with the truth. It may seem outdated to some. I'm staying with the truth. It may seem too old fashioned to others. I'm staying with the truth. You know why? You'll never be the church unless you're the supporter and the safeguarder standing with the truth. You might go, might be at a church, but when you leave the truth, you're not being the church. I'll give you some, just throw this out. We live in a day where they say, now we got to make it seeker sensitive. That sound good. This ain't in this King James Bible. We got to get together and pull folks in. Show them this and show them that. Sounds good. But Jesus Christ himself said, I didn't come to bring peace. I come to bring a sword. I'm going to divide husband and wife and mother and father and children. He said, you know why it's going to divide them? Because some's going to go that way and they're going to lean that way and they're going to go for entertainment and they're going to go for this watered down evangelism and this one, two, three, repeat after me prayer. But I tell you what I'm going to do by the good grace of God, I'm going to just stand over here on the ground of the truth. Just be the supporter and the safeguarder of the truth. If you want to know the truth, Ask Brother Weaver. Best he knows. Now, I don't know it all, but best I know, I'll give you the truth. Just don't get mad at me when you when I do. Because I'm just being the church. Next time, when I was pastoring, I'll give it this way. I was pastoring. Folks would come up to me. Now, I'm real sensitive and big-hearted, and, you know, real soft. My members would come up to me and they'd say, Preacher, you think it'd be all right? I'd say, No. I said, well, you didn't even let me finish. I said, if you got to ask me if it's right for you or not, you already know it's not right. Just stand on the truth. Just be a supporter and uh, uh, stay with, just stay with the truth. Always remember, when you leave the truth, my son done it. I stood in the pulpit and by, did everything but call him by name. The men shouted and told me, said, we're glad uh, we got a pastor that'll preach the truth even when it's against his own boy. But when one of those those men's boy done it and I preached against it he quit and left the church you know what he quit being he quit being the church and he didn't do that teenage boy no good cause he told him you ain't gotta listen to nothing the preacher said when I went to church you didn't get to speak you didn't get to move you didn't you could sit uh, anywhere you wanted as long as it was in front of where you we didn't get my mama sat on about the third uh, we didn't get to sit behind the third pew mm -mm. I leaned over one time to say something to the pastor's youngest son. We were buddies. I leaned over to say something one time and before I got my mouth open good, my mom about pulled my left ear off running me to the back and uh, tanning my hat. She could only tan my hat. My dad didn't even go to church. He wasn't a spiritual man at all. When we got home, she said, your son was a talking in church. There wasn't no need to try to explain I was worshiping or anything. There wasn't no need to try doing that. My daddy didn't tan my hat. He knocked a hide off me so bad when I went back that night, I couldn't sit down. You know what I didn't do? I didn't talk no more in church, praise God. But my pastor stood on the truth 
whether you liked it or not, whether you wanted it or not, when everybody else is going and folks are leaving, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stay with the truth because I want to be the church. I'll give you this when I'm finished. We ought to be the church, not, be, not just because the master of the church, I love my master, not, because, not just because of the must of the church, the pillar and ground of the truth, but because of the message of the church. Now it's been watered down and compromised, and it's been sidestepped and changed and brought low. But I'm going to give you, what Paul does here doesn't give a whole exegesis of the message of the gospel, but he gives us the highlights to Timothy here. We'll look at them. Here's the message of the church. Watch verse number 16. He said, and without controversy, ain't even nobody denying it. Ain't nobody arguing or fussing about this part. That great is the mystery of godliness. How in the world can no account low down sinners that we were ever be godly? Well, a mystery, when you see that word mystery in the Bible, especially in the New Testament, what it is speaking of is something that has not been revealed but is now being revealed. So I'm going to make it real simple to understand this mystery of godliness. Mystery of godliness equals Jesus Christ. Christ, because here's the message of the church. He said, great, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Then he says, God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit. What we have here is the revelation of Jesus Christ. God became a man. Jesus loved us so much. He would not sit idly by and let us go to hell though we deserve to go. But he laid aside the diadems of deity. Took off the robes of royalty. Clothed himself in a body of flesh. When I could not come to where he was. Hallelujah. He got up off the throne and came to me. We have a message to tell that Jesus Christ has come to seek and to save that which was lost. He didn't send an emissary. He didn't come in a spiritual form. He didn't sneak up on us like some ghost. Hallelujah. He came as a man to reach men. I heard it all my life growing up. The Son of God became the Son of Man so the sons of men might become the sons of God. He is manifest. He is revealed. He is made known. God was made known to us in flesh. Up until then, God started out as the God way up in heaven. <laughs> then he became the God over there on a hill. Then he became the God down at the house, the tabernacle and the temple. But now... He's God in human form. He become God in human form, if you will. And now he's God in our hearts. Here's the message. Jesus was born of a virgin. Let me just throw this in. Nothing immaculate about the birth of Jesus. Nothing immaculate about his birth. May rebirth Jesus. Just like women have been birthing children since Eve had her first boy. The immaculate part came under conception. Because God was manifest in the flesh. He wasn't manifest flesh. He wasn't manifest. Uh, he was as flesh. He was in flesh, but he was God. And God became a man. Then he says this. Here's the revelation. Justified in the spirit. Uh-oh. Justified. Justified. He had to be justified. Don't misunderstand the word. Uh, let me put it this way. What Paul jumped from is he moves from God came in human form, uh, lived and died, was buried and resurrected. And the morning he stepped out on resurrection morning, he was declared to be the son of God uh, by the resurrection of the dead, justified in the spirit. He is revealing to us the true gospel of Jesus Christ that he came came to man, that he came for man, he died for man, he was buried and rose again the third day. That's the message that we have to tell this world, the revelation of Jesus. 
But not only the revelation of Jesus, what's these next two phrases? He said, seen of angels preached unto the Gentiles. Now we have the message to tell them about the reach of Jesus. <laughs> seen of angels. He can reach all the way to the heavens. Preached unto the Gentiles. Now you might not know this because we think a lot of ourselves now, but in Bible days, Gentiles were no better than wild dogs. We had no covenant with God. We had no house with God. We had no emissary, if you will, with God. We were hopeless and helpless and cut off. We were the enemies of God. We were the lowest of the low. Gentiles, the lowest of the low. We were called heathen. We were all of those things. But thank God, God when Jesus come the message now is uh, that no matter how high you are uh, he can reach you and no matter how low you are you may be on the wrong side of the tracks born on the poor white trash side of town you may be a drunkard or a harlot you may be in prison it doesn't matter how low you went it's not too low for him hallelujah he can come all the way to the lowest well preacher you don't know what I done I don't have to know what you done I know what he did hallelujah I don't have to know who you are I know who he is he can reach way down he'll reach farther down than you'll ever be able to reach up he preached unto the Gentiles I'm glad hallelujah that his arm is not shortened that it cannot save no matter who you are no matter who you are talking to no matter how deep in sin they're not too far for the hand of the Lord Jesus to reach down and save them. Not too far for the Lord, praise God, from the highest heaven. I believe it was the psalmist David said, I sin, take the wings and ascend up into heaven. Thou art there. If I make my bed all the way down in the lowest hell, you there too. <laughs> I got news for you. And he's everywhere in between. No matter where you at on the, uh, on the society rung of the ladder. No matter where you are on the center rung of the ladder. No matter how bad it looks. No matter how bad you've done. Uh, no matter how bad you've been. Not too bad for him. Uh, not too far much for him. Not too far away for him. You can come to him. Because he came for you. That's the message of the church. The revelation of Jesus. The reach of Jesus. This and I'm finished. What's these last two? Believed on in the world. Received up in the glory. Now we have simply the receiving or the reception of Jesus. Now I'm going to say something here. Hang on, buckle up. I'm talking about in the New Testament. Nobody is told in the New Testament to accept Jesus. Nobody's told to accept him. Our message is not to tell the world to accept Jesus. Our message actually is that he will accept them. Right. The message is that we re tell them to receive Jesus. Yeah. To, uh, he came unto his own and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave you power to become the sons of God nobody in our New Testament especially after Acts 2 ever got saved praying a prayer asking Jesus into the heart you know how they got saved they got saved the same way everybody's always got saved give you an example Acts chapter number 8 Ethiopian unit returning from the temple he couldn't get in the temple so he bought a scroll he's riding back he's reading Isaiah 53 and the spirit of God comes on Philip and says join yourself with him Philip jumps up in the chariot and says understandest thou what thou readest and he said is the prophet talking about himself or is he speaking of another here's the church Peter I mean Philip had started at the same verse opened his mouth well, I'm going to just live it in front of them. You ought to live it in front of them. But every chance you get, use words. Because Philip opened 
his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached Jesus unto him. And if Ethiopian eunuch said, there's water, what hindereth me to be baptized? Boy, you'll take a lot of flack on that from some of these guys. But let me clear it up right quick because if you keep the Bible simple, like I, I can understand the simple. i tell you what kept the Ethiopian eunuch from being baptized. Same thing, keep you from being baptized and me from being baptized. You got to be saved first. You got to, and Philip said, if you believe uh, on Jesus Christ uh, you can be baptized and that Ethiopian unit didn't pray no prayers uh, he didn't go through no Philippian jails he didn't go up nothing he just said I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God and the next verse says they both went down in the water you know what it was Jesus was received uh, you received Jesus by believing on him that, that Philippian jailer broke in said sirs what must I do to be saved uh, he had broke in the average Baptist church and said pray this prayer after me but that ain't what Paul told him Paul said if thou shalt believe upon the name uh, if thou shalt believe on the Lord Jesus Christ thou shalt be saved uh, believed on in the world uh, received hallelujah you just take him just like he is uh, you take him just like he's offered uh, you take him when he's offered you receive him see accepting him makes it seem like you can think about it uh, I'll decide whether I no, when he comes to knocking and when he comes to convicting and when he comes to drawing, you'll take him then and believe on him or you'll go to hell without God. When he's a speaking, you'll move or you'll be lost forever. Hallelujah. Believed on in the world. He was received. I remember the morning I received him. I can't tell you what I prayed. I can't tell you what all I knew and didn't know. All I knew is I seen that Jesus loved me. I didn't ever feel like nobody really loved me loved me. I popped up out of that pew, went to an old fashioned altar I'd have took him no matter what he thought, no matter what he said uh, no matter how it was, I believed that my only hope, I believed that my only love, uh, I believed that my only life was in Jesus Christ and when you believe on him, uh, saved saved, saved uh, believed on in the world, received Then he's received up in the glory. You imagine that? The prince had been gone. They throwed open the gates. The angel stood at attention. And the word come out, straighten up. The prince of glory is a come on. He blessed his disciples from the Mount of Olives. He began to ascend into heaven. And they stood there watching him as a cloud took him out of their sight. In heaven he walked through the gate. He walked up and God the Father said, Son, sit down right here at my right hand until I make all of your enemies your footstool. He's alive and well and doing all right. He's only highly exalted. When they received him up in heaven, when Jesus came, do you know this? That he made himself nothing. He poured himself completely out. Made himself of no reputation. Matter of fact, Isaiah said that when we looked at him, we saw no comeliness or beauty that we should desire him. There wasn't nothing about him special looking that we should want him. He emptied himself. But when they received him back up in the glory, the next time we see him, and he's described, Revelation 19, on his head were many crowns. They're probably flying around the crowning him now. Still crowning him. Still crowning him. One of these days, he's Lord of Lords and King of Kings, but one of these days, uh, we're going to crown him Lord of Lords. We're not going to make him Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We're going to crown him. They'll cry across and say, Bring forth the royal diadem, uh, and we'll be there when they crown him. He was received up in the glory. In other words, the Father said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done, my son. Well done. That's the message. That that we have to the world. So I say this. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Be the church. Not just belong to it, not just be at it, but be the church. Pastor Yuka. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.